tonight is the full moon night and the full moon night has a special significance in the Buddhist tradition in all Buddhist traditions I would say that there is only one Buddhist tradition that's the teaching of the Buddha the rest are different methods to become enlightened that's all there is and as you know I have also taught you different methods I don't know whether they're to become enlightened that's up to you but there is only one tradition that's Buddhism and the Buddha didn't even teach Buddhism he taught the Dhamma that's all the word Buddhism was coined later just like Jesus did not teach Christianity that was coined much later Jesus was a reformer he wanted to reform Judaism don't know that he did a very good job on it Um, but the Buddha had the same problem he wanted to reform Brahmanism which it was called in those days uh, what we call Hinduism now didn't do such a wonderful job on that either Um, instead of the reform something new started so both of them really had the same thing at heart that that what they were born into because Jesus was born into Judaism and the Buddha was born into Brahmanism that was what they were born into was not satisfied because it had been totally diluted and it had been practiced wrongly or not at all so in, in the Buddhist tradition there is a special significance to the full moon night and the reason for that is that tradition says that the Buddha was born under the full moon he became enlightened under the full moon and he also died on the full moon night so the full moon night is a very important night also was born became enlightened and died under a tree so that too is important trees are very important now in the Buddhist country of the Theravadan tradition of which we still have three Burma, Thailand and Sri Lanka I know that two of them I don't know about Burma because I haven't been there in a long long time it's very difficult now to get there in Thailand and Sri Lanka not only is the full moon day an official holiday banks are closed post offices closed businesses are closed some non-Buddhist businesses also closed of course and to the great delight of everybody under 18 schools are closed there are three other moon days which are celebrated but not through the closure of the business and the schools and that's the the rising moon and the the quarter, the half and then the waning moon so there are actually four moon days in the month of which the one that has the full one is the most important one the full moon in May is called Vesak and it's the highest holiday of the Buddhist tradition it is supposed to be the day that the Buddha was born became enlightened and died whether that all took place on the same day nobody knows but it's celebrated on the same day it's probably just as fictitious a day as Christmas is not the birthday of Jesus but you've got to have a day somewhere so it is the full moon day in May and Vesak is a very important 
the most important holiday in the Buddhist calendar. One of the traditions on the full moon day is for people in these uh, Buddhist countries is to come to the temple and stay there. Take eight precepts, be dressed in white, which is an outward show of inner purity. Whether the two go together or not, one doesn't know, but at least it is uh, that kind of symbolism. Stay in the temple, chant, listen to a Dhamma talk, meditate as much as they know how, and very often also take the precept of not having any food after lunch on that day. So it's a sort of a holiday day which is taken on a spiritual level. This is very common and in monasteries and nunneries the tradition is practically everywhere where the practice is taken seriously no, everywhere where the practice is taken seriously which is not practically everywhere that one stays up all night and meditates to the best of one's ability and what we used to do at Parapadua Nans Island we used to have coffee at 12 o'clock and um, then continue on till four o'clock and then do the morning chanting uh, at four o'clock and then have uh, a short rest and then come back to the hall at six o'clock. And the tiredness only arose the next evening. It wasn't that same evening. So, um, the reason I'm telling you this is I'm suggesting to anybody who wants to do to go along with this tradition and stay up and meditate here as long as they can possibly keep their eyes open and um, have coffee at 12 o'clock if you like. It's, um, it's a very... Well, one of the things which arises out of that is a feeling of contentment with having made the right effort even if the if the meditation was nowhere <laughs> one has tried right both of these girls in front of me a ladies women sorry <laughs> in front of me have spent time on Carlton do an unsilent. So one has that feeling, yes, we've done it. We've really tried. It's a very good feeling. It's a feeling of having overcome sloth and torpor. Because sloth and torpor is inbuilt. It's part of the whole trip that we're on. It's uh, very not easy to overcome. And sometimes we overcome it with going to the other extreme, which is uh, being excited and agitated, and that doesn't work either. The reason it's so important to use the time as much as one can, because I mentioned one time that the next Buddha will only arise eons away. Now, eons in the um, in Sanskrit are kalpa and in Pali are kappa. That's called one world period. So that's one eon. And here is a out of a sutta from the Buddha and description how long one eon, one kappa, lasts. First it says, it's an inconceivably long space of time, an eon, a so-called eternity, that also is subdivided into four sections. Dissolving world, continuation of the chaos, world formation, 
and continuation of the formed world. So this is only the commentary. Suppose, O monks, there was a huge rock of one solid mass, one mile long, one mile wide, one mile high, without split or flaw, and at the end of every hundred years a man should come and rub against it one time with a silken cloth. Then that huge rock would wear off and disappear quicker than a world period. So I think that's already enough, huh? <laughs> but it goes on. But of such world periods, O monks, many have passed away, many hundreds, many thousands, many hundred thousand. And how is this possible? Inconceivable, O monks, is this samsara, this round of birth and death. Not to be discovered is there any first beginning of beings who, obstructed by ignorance and ensnared by craving, are hurrying and hastening through this round of rebirth. So, if we can have a look at this, uh, that one eon, it's uh, uh, if this, this rock would appear quicker than one eon would uh, go be finished, and this next Buddha is to arise in many eons from now, and this teaching is going to completely disappear in another two and a half thousand years, which is within this world period. And at this point in time, it has taken a great upswing. Maybe then the urgency, if it hasn't arisen yet, might arise. That's why I was reading out this. Um, actually, there's another little um, simile here, which is from a German fairy tale, from Grimm's fairy tale. And it says, in 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 far Pomerania, there is a diamond mountain, one hour high, one hour wide, and one hour deep. And every hundred years, a little bird comes and wets its little beak on it. And when the whole mountain is ground off, then the first second of eternity has passed. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I thought maybe this might uh, induce people to have a bit of... Um, urgency to practice. I'll tell you a story about the full moon. It's one of the most famous Jataka tales. Now the Jataka tales are, one could say, something like Aesop's fables. They are fables about, they have all have a moral content, and they are purported to be stories of the Buddha's former life. But, and they're all about animals. They're all uh, animal stories. And they have a great similarity of two fables in other uh, cultures. All cultures have fables in them. And they, they are sort of like a real um, foundation of a society or a culture. And these are Jatakas. They're called Jatakas. And there are approximately 400 of those. And some are really lovely. Some are ideal to teach children something about Buddhism. Now, these are, as I said, purported to be the Buddha's former life when he was born as an animal. But whether that's so or not, it has no bearing on the story. This um, story about the full moon, there was a hare and an otter and a fox living in the same forest. And they were very good friends. And they were living a very nice life because the forest was full of food for them. And one day the hare started thinking, shouldn't we be doing something for somebody else? Should we only be looking after ourselves all the time? Doesn't seem right. So he got his two friends, and the three sat together. 
And the hare said, I have this idea. And the next full moon day, if there is a traveler coming through this forest, we should have food ready for him and offer him something nice to eat because that means that we at least do something for somebody else. And the other two agreed. So when the next full moon was coming near, they went out to find something that they could have on hand if a traveler came. So the otter went down to the river and sniffed around and smelled that there were some fish that had been buried in the sand on the bank. So he got the sand aside and found the fish and he yelled out, Is there an owner to this diseased fish? No answer. So again he yelled out, Is there an owner here? No answer. So he did that three times. Didn't get an answer. So he figured there can't be an owner. So he took the fish and took them to his lair where he was living. And the fox thought about what he was going to do and he saw a little hut that one of the farmers had built on a field next to the forest where he would spend his noon hour resting from his labors. So he peeked into this little hut and he saw the lunch. There was a lunch packet there. So he yelled out, is there an owner to this lunch packet? And he didn't get an answer three times. So he took the lunch packet and kept that. And the hare was thinking all the time, now what am I going to do? I can't think of anything. All I'm ever collecting is just grass and, and weeds and that's all I'm ever eating. I can't think what I could offer a traveler that would come through here. And then he had the bright idea. He was going to offer himself. He was going to offer himself to this traveler so that he could have a very nice meal from the making a barbecue of this hair. So the story says that Saka, the king of the gods, who sits on the throne in one of the higher deva realms, feels when somebody on earth makes an enormously generous decision because the throne gets hot. (laughs) (laughs) So his throne got hot and he looked down to see what was going on and he saw that this hare was making this decision to give himself as a meal to any traveler that would come through. And because that would be so generous that Saka's throne would be in danger because if it was more generous than Saka had been, then maybe that being would become the king of the gods. He thought he would go down and test that uh, being to see whether it was really true, that this decision was not just on the spur of a moment and wasn't going to be carried through, but whether it was true generosity. So he disguised himself as a very old man who was uh, limping and was uh, uh, dressed in rags and went down to the forest on the full moon day. And then he started walking slowly, limping through the forest, bent over. And first he encountered the fox. And the fox uh, called out to him, Old man, stop a moment. I have something nice to give you. I have some food for you. But Saka said, no, no, I'll come back later. I have no time now because he wanted to test the hair. So then he went a little further and then he encountered the otter. And the otter called out and said, stop a a moment, old man. I have a very nice meal for you. I have some nice fish for you. And uh, Saka said, no, thank you. I'll come back later. So they both stood there, a little disappointed, but hoping he was going to come back. And so he went a little further and then he encountered the hare. And the hare said, oh, I'm very glad to see a traveler. Please stop. I will prepare a meal for you. And so Saka stopped and said, yes, what are you going to do? 
So the hare said to him, please get some twigs together and make a fire. And so he did, he got twigs together and made a fire. And then the hare said, now I will jump in that fire, and then when I'm nicely roasted, you can eat me. <laughs> so he jumped in. But the fire was ice cold. And so he said to the traveler, he said, old man, what kind of fire have you made? It doesn't even singe my the hair over my lips. It doesn't have any heat in it. And then, of course, the old man took <coughs> off all this um, um, disguise that he was wearing and came out in his full glory as Saka, king of the gods. And he said, oh, I'm Saka, the king of the gods. I was just testing you. And uh, this fire is will never burn anything. But I will make a monument to you, to your generosity. And he uh, put his hand back to the rock behind him and squeezed some mountain juice, rock juice, out of this rock. And with this rock juice, he painted the picture of the hair in the moon. And if you go out tonight to look at the full moon, you will find the hair in the full moon. And that's the monument to the great generosity of giving oneself fully. Now, as I told you, all of these tales have a moral to them. All of them. They're all meant to show us something. This one obviously talks about generosity and doing things for others. But it also talks about following through on one's generosity. And it also talks about giving oneself wholeheartedly. So it has all those things embedded in it. And all these stories are told in a way that one can tell them to children. So it is really... Um, useful as, uh, as an introduction to Buddhism. I was going to ask you whether, I can't remember whether I have told this, these stories in the seven-day course or whether I've told you, them to you already. Have I told you the story of Sujata? Here. Okay. Have I told you the story of Kema? Okay. I'll tell you the story of the weaver's daughter. This is also an interesting story which has application to the teaching that you have heard here. The story says that the Buddha sat in meditation every morning and spread out his net of compassion to see whom he could catch in it, which meant that he was looking for those people who were enough advanced in their understanding so that if he taught them, he could, they could become enlightened. So this one morning, he spread out his net of compassion, which is clairvoyance, uh, coupled with his unbounded compassion, and he caught in it a 17-year-old weaver's daughter, a daughter of a weaver. Now, a weaver is a low caste in India. It's not a high caste person, it's a low caste person. And she was 17 years old. And she was in a village quite far away. So he immediately got to walking towards that village, which in itself shows that he would go a long way to teach one person. He was determined to show people who were ready for it the way out of Dukkha. He did not go by quantity. It was strictly quality. Those who had that inner understanding, they were shown. So he got to this village and there were, and the people saw him coming and they got all excited because they knew that he was a great teacher. And so they got everything ready for him. They got the seat ready, and they got water ready, and they got the meal ready. And um, and after he had had his meal, 
he said he will now give a teaching. And he gave a teaching about the five daily recollections and with particular emphasis on I'm of the nature to die. I have not got beyond death. And he talked about how important it was to look at one's own death and to realize that there was uh, only a limited time for practicing and for becoming peaceful and to realize a higher state of consciousness because nobody knew when one would die. Well, all these people that had prepared the meal and prepared the seats and had got the water for him, everything, they were all sitting there. And um, it seemed they were listening. So then at the end, he asked them, now, do you know where you come from? And they had no idea what to say and they said yes of course we know where we came from and they gave their addresses and houses where they came from and then he said and do you know where you're going to and they said oh yes yes we know where we're going to Um, and they said with with their next uh, uh, occupation what they were going to do then he turned to the weaver's daughter and he said do you know where you came from she said no and he said do you know where you're going to she said no And they all thought that she was being very naughty, that she was answering like that. And they were talking to each other and saying, but look, she's the weaver's daughter. She knows where she came from. The weaver lives over there. And she knows where she's going. She's going back to the weaver. And so they thought she was terrible. But she had understood correctly what the Buddha meant was, where did you come from to have this life? And where are you going to after death? That's what he had been talking about to them. And she was the only one of this whole assembly, and there were several hundred of them there, the whole village was there, that understood that. So he said to her, I will come back in three months. Meanwhile, practice. And she understood completely that what he meant was that every day in those three months she should think about dying and her own death and realize that everything is so impermanent and so fleeting that she was no longer holding on. So she did she did that and three months later she came back he came back. Now on the day he came back to that village she was very excited that she could now see the Buddha again and tell him that she had gained real insight and as she was just going to run down to the place where the Buddha was going to be her father called her back and said that she, he needed her help that she had to help with the loom and as she was going to get a hold of the loom that loom slipped from her hand and hit her and killed her and so the Buddha was standing down, down at the marketplace waiting for, for her and he was waiting the other people had all uh, collected already and so he sent somebody to the weaver's house for her and then this uh, accident was, um, became known and then the Buddha said she died enlightened so this weaver's daughter died enlightened because she had been practicing for three months seeing her own death but had let go of hanging on so you can see from that story how important it is to practice that also to know one's own death it can happen any moment and if we don't accept it that it can happen any moment we have a constant rejection of it We don't want to know about it. As long as we have a rejection in here, we've got a blockage in here. As long as we've got a blockage, we can't be liberated. We can only be liberated from dukkha if everything is completely open. So this is uh, uh, one of the famous stories 
of the um, Buddha's compassion to teach one person and on top of that a young girl of a low caste which in India made a lot of difference I mean, in our case it's low caste it doesn't man- mean anything but in India it meant a lot there's an interesting discourse by the Buddha which is called the Kalama Sutta and I think it's a very important one to know about because it seems to have enormous application to what happens to people nowadays with the Buddha's teaching the Kalama were a warrior caste which was a well educated caste in those days and they were also known to be very intelligent and their capital was called Kesaputta and one day it was, became known that the Buddha was going to come to Kesaputta and so the Kalama people who had not, uh, when were not followers of the Buddha decided that they would come out to the open place outside the gates of Kesaputta to hear him uh, give a discourse so they all got together and went outside and the story says that some of them prostrated some of them called out their own name some of them called out the name of their clan some of them just sat down some of, some of them just greeted him which shows that there was a uh, usual Indian chaos and uh, that these people were not his followers because if they were his followers it all would have prostrated so after they'd all sat down the village elder or the um, maybe the magistrate or whoever was in charge of of the of Kesaputta got up and said he would like to ask a question and the Buddha said yes and he said that many teachers have come to Kesaputta and each one of the teachers has been immensely able to preach his own doctrine but each teacher had also said that all the other teachers had the wrong doctrine and now they didn't know what to believe anymore now they were completely in doubt and so the Buddha said you are in doubt about a doubtful matter and I will tell you what criteria to use in order to know what is the right teaching so he asked them about the five precepts whether breaking any of those five precepts killing, stealing sexual misconduct wrong speech and fermented uh, substances alcohol and drugs whether breaking that uh, training would be to their happiness and to the happiness of others and they said no they would get quite unhappy from it they would have bad results and then he asked them if they kept those precepts would that be for their own happiness and happiness of others and they said yes that would be for their happiness and happiness to others which is the first instance of the precepts have to be included in any spiritual teaching if they're not included then the teaching we can forget about it it's a, it is the basic underlying foundation and then he gave the following points which are not to be used in order to follow a spiritual teaching and this is the only time in the history of all spiritual teachings that, it, that uh, the master of the, that teaching included himself in this it's never been done before because no, the Buddha never wanted anyone to follow him he propounded his message for the benefit of suffering mankind he was never a guru and he didn't want any gurus to be in his dispensation so the points which are not to be used in order to follow a teaching 
are very interesting for us because they are applying to everything that goes on in our world just as much as it did then. The first one is not to follow a teaching because it's written in a holy book. Not to follow a teaching because it's been transmitted from teacher to disciple. Not to follow a teaching because it's in a lineage. Not to follow a teaching because you believe it anyway. It's, a, uh, it's in accord with that which you want to believe anyway. Not to follow a teaching because your friends and relations are following it. Not to follow a teaching because you can make logical deductions from it. Not to follow a teaching because it has some metaphysical uh, connotations. Not to follow a teaching because when you do, then you have just moments where you feel better. Not to follow a teaching because the teacher is a reputable person and not to follow a teaching because the teacher said so. But if you know for yourself that this is beneficial, that this will be of benefit to you and to others and has universal truth in it, then you can follow it by through your own investigation and practice. Now this is, a, I think, one of the most pertinent uh, discourses of the Buddha for today's confusion. That confusion is rampant and I think those points need to be um, used for one's own investigation. Do I believe it because it's lineage? Do I believe it because it's written in a holy book? Do I believe it because my friends say so? Do I believe it because I can logically explain it? Do I believe it because it makes me happy sometimes? Do I believe it because the teacher said so? Or can I really understand that it's my benefit that I'm gaining in spiritual stature and it's the benefit of others. So one has to use one's own wisdom. And this is a very interesting aspect of the Buddha's teaching that he's always putting us back onto our own wisdom. It's a very important uh, part of the teaching because we'll only get as far on this path as our own wisdom will take us. And that's only fair. Nobody else's wisdom is going to do anything for us. So we'll have to be very grounded in this. We can't expect things to happen up there somewhere. It's all very grounded. There's a story which is the um, description of the kind of mind that meditators often encounter. It's a story of a monk who took his nephew as a novice, as a novice monk. And then one day the elder monk was invited to Katina. Now, Katina is a festival at the end of the rains retreat when monks and nuns get new robes. And if you are an elder monk and maybe well-respected and well-known, you get a lot of robes. Now, this elder monk was already over 70 and had more than enough robes. So he said to his nephew, the novice, he said, look, I've got so many robes, you go and you get the robes. Huh? So the novice said, okay. So he went to this temple and he was given two sets of robes. You don't usually get the robes, you usually get the material. So you got, he got two sets uh, of material which each one would make the robes. And one was very fine, silky and shiny. And one was more ordinary, more like cotton, not so uh, elegant. 
And so on his way back, he decided he was going to give the silky, shiny one to his uncle and keep the other one. So when he got home to his uncle, he said, uh, Sir, I've got two sets, and I'll give you this nice one. So the old monk said, Look, I really don't need any robes. You keep it. But the young novice was didn't um, appreciate that. He felt that his uncle was rejecting him. So he got angry. He got angry, but not that the uncle wasn't accepting his robe. And so he said, huh, to himself, that if he doesn't want the robes, huh, I'll go and sell them and disrobe. And just when he was thinking that, the uncle said to him, it's so hot in here, come and fan me. So, of course, the young novice said, yes, sir. And he took the fan and started fanning the old uncle. And while he was fanning him, he thought, oh, he doesn't want to take my robes, huh? Well, I'll just disrobe and, and, uh, and sell them in the market. And I'm sure to get enough money to buy myself a cow. And once I have that cow, I'll milk it. And then, having milked her, of course, I can sell that milk. And having sold the milk, then, of course, I can, I have quite a lot of money, I can buy a second cow, and I'll put them both in calves, and then I can sell both calves, and then I can sell the milk from both cows, and very soon I'll have enough money to get myself a wife. And having got the wife, after one year we're sure to have a baby, and in good old Indian tradition, it's sure to be a boy. <laughs> and then, when the little baby is about three months old, we have to come and show him to my uncle. And my wife will insist to carry this baby. And then, when we come here, she'll be stumbling over the threshold and almost stopped the baby. So I'm going to have to hit her. And at that moment, he took the fan and hit the uncle. And the uncle said, but, you know, just because your wife is dropping the baby is no reason to hit me. (laughs) (laughs) It sounds like a meditation session. So that's the meditative mind, huh? (laughs) Then we have a a story which is about um, conceit about attainments. Also not uncommon. There was an old monk and a younger monk who was his uh, student. And he stayed with him for five years, which is the traditional time that a pupil should stay with the teacher if they really want to learn everything that the teacher can give. Actually, live with the teacher for five years. It's a traditional thing in monasteries and nunneries and uh, also outside of them. And after five years, the old monk said to the young one, he said, now you've been here five years. It's time that you went to see some other teachers and see what they're teaching and see whether there's more you can learn from them. So he went off on his on a trip and he went to a few teachers and after two years of that traveling and seeing different teachers, he became enlightened. And as soon as he became enlightened, his mind immediately went to his old teacher because the gratitude was great and as his mind went to the old teacher, he realized that the old teacher thought he was enlightened, but he wasn't. So immediately he made up his mind that he was going to help him. So he went back and um, to the cave where the old teacher was living. And of course he couldn't say to him, oh, look, I'm going to help you get enlightened. But he said, uh, after they had greeted each other nicely, uh, he said to him, sir, can you make a vision appear? And the old monk said, yeah, sure, what would you like to see? And he said, oh, I'd like to see an elephant. So he made an elephant appear, a huge elephant in the cave where the bulls were sitting. 
And the young monk said, oh, that's wonderful. But can you make that vision also move? And the old monk said, sure, I can make it move. What do you want it to do? He said, uh, I want it to attack you. And that moment, the old monk got afraid. Fear arose. And in that moment, he knew that he wasn't enlightened. And he said to the young monk, you better help me. <laughs> and so he helped him. It's uh, uh, the uh, it, it's something that one needs to check up over and over again. How are my reactions? Honestly, how do I react? We don't have to tell anybody, but how do I react? I mean, other people, if they get the reaction, they know anyway. <laughs> It's the only criteria we've got. How do I react? So this old monk knew immediately when he said, I wanted to want the elephant to attack you. He knew immediately if he was going to do that. Was, immediately there was this feeling of fear. So this is an important thing for us also to know and to do. There's um, <coughs> another jataka which is also um, has reference to our lives. The reference is to our hanging on to material possessions and the pride of material possessions, to having them, to keeping them, and uh, to valuing them. A story is about a king who went with his entourage into the forest. And as they were riding in the forest, they came across a beautiful mango tree. And this beautiful mango tree was full of fruit. It looked wonderful because you know a mango tree is green leaves and pinkish, yellowish fruit that looks really beautiful. And uh, so they, when they got back to the palace, the king decided he would like to send some servants to collect some of the mangoes. So the next day, he sent out some servants to collect some of these mangoes because he liked to eat mangoes. And so he told them exactly where to find the tree. And uh, as they went to the forest, they couldn't find any mango tree with mangoes on it. They came up with, across a huge tree that looked totally bedraggled. All its branches were broken. All its leaves had been um, cut off or had been hit by, by a stick so that they had fallen off. There wasn't a single mango left on the tree. But they could see that that must have been the tree because there were squashed mangoes on the ground. So that must have been the tree. But it, the whole tree was a total mess. And they went a few steps further to see if there was any other mango tree. And they came across another one. And it looked beautiful. All the leaves were intact. All the branches were intact. It didn't have a single mango on it. So they went back to the king and told him about it and said, you know that mango tree that you said with all the mangoes on it, it looked terrible. It had been broken off and all the leaves were off and was completely bedraggled. And it must have been the right tree because all the, there were a lot of mangoes on the ground which had been squashed. But right next to it, there was another mango tree, but it didn't have any mangoes, so we're very sorry. We couldn't bring you any mangoes. And the king thought about this. And so, he didn't believe it. He thought, oh, these people, they're too lazy to go in the forest and get me the mangoes. So he himself got on the horse. And he himself got back to the forest. And by golly, it was true. He found exactly what they had told him, what was there. And when he sat there, looking at this bedraggled mango tree, where every mango had been robbed, 
and then the beautiful one that had never had a mango on it he decided to give his whole kingdom away he took off his crown and he gave his crown and scepter to the ministers and he said you can have the kingdom and he built himself a little hut in the forest and never had anything more to do with running the kingdom not a bad story for our affluent society <laughs> I'll tell you another story you might know this one it's very well known it's a Zen story Zen stories are usually quite well known it's a story about two Zen monks an elder Zen monk and a younger one and they were in a temple that was not their home temple so they had to walk back to their home temple that was quite a distance so they both walked along and it started pouring rain so they walked and they walked and finally they came to a river and because of this pouring rain the river had swollen and a pretty young lady was standing on this side of the river and she was afraid to walk through the river to the other side so the elder monk picked her up carried her across put her down and walked and the younger one trips behind and as they kept on walking the young one started thinking what my teacher has done we're not even allowed, supposed to look at women and he picked one up and then a few steps later and he held her quite close and then another few steps later and he carried her all the way through the river and he had his arms around her and he kept on like this and another hour he said and this is my teacher and we're not supposed to touch women women and then another hour and he thought and he got himself into such a stew after two hours that he went up to the teacher and said teacher I've got to talk to you the teacher said yes what is it he said you know back there at the river you picked up this woman and you held her quite close and you carried her all the way across the river and the teacher said well I put her right down but you're still carrying her <laughs> maybe, that's maybe a good story about teachers isn't it and about carrying things around Okay, one more. Let's go to all the names down of these stories. This is again a story about one of the kings at the time of the Buddha, who had the story says 500 wives. <laughs> <laughs> one imagine. <laughs> most most men can't get along with one. <laughs> so anyway he had 500 and one day he decided it was going to be a picnic they're going to have a picnic in the forest and so the evening before this picnic was supposed to happen he, was, he let all these 500 wives know that this was going to happen and they were supposed to get ready in the morning and 500 elephants had to be uh, get, got ready so that they could ride into the forest and the cooks all had to make everything ready for the picnic and so the next day this happened they went into the forest and uh, had this picnic the cooks had an enormous spread of uh, food and drink and so after a little while the king had so eaten and drunk so much that uh, he got he started snoring fell asleep and so the wives said to each other look this is our chance he's fast asleep we don't often get out of this palace let's go and have a look at the forest so they all got together and they started walking into the forest along the path and they enjoyed the butterflies and the sun going through the coming through the trees and they enjoyed the different little uh, plants they saw and uh, had a nice time and very soon they came to a hut and there was an old 
sage sitting in front of the hut and they recognized him because he was very famous his name was Kanti Vardhan teacher of patience Kanti is patience Vardhan is teacher and so they all sat down in front of him and they said uh, sir give us a teaching tell us uh, uh, give us a Dhamma discourse and he said yes I will and so he started telling them about patience Meanwhile, the king had woken up and not a wife to be seen. So he got quite upset and he sent out his soldiers to bring the wives back and look for them in the forest. And uh, so they went out to look for the wife and they were very easy to find. They were all sitting in front of the hut of uh, Kantivaden. And so they went back to the king and said, Sir, there's nothing to be upset about. They're listening to a uh, preaching by uh, Kantivadin. and but the king was either totally befuddled by wine or he was uh, a very nasty person anyway he was furious and he said oh this old Kantivadin, he's trying to get my wives away from me go and bring these wives back here so the soldiers had to go and bring the wives back they did and then he said and now tie Kantivadin to the next tree newest tree. So they had to obey to the king. So they did. And then the king in his fury he was absolutely furious about this supposed uh, uh, alienation of all his wives stalked up to Kantevan and said uh, well your patience is going to be tested. And he took his sword the king and cut off an arm. And he said to Kantivana, where's your patience now? And he said, sir, it's not in my arm. And of course that made the king even more furious. And he cut off her foot. And he said, where is it now? And he said, not in my foot. And so he kept cutting and cutting till the Kantivana was on the verge of dying. And, sorry? He was furious. <laughs> That's going to take his wife away from him. If you can't understand the story. He's dying. So then, huh? Where are we? <laughs> so then when just before he was dying the um, soldiers who had come with the king said to Kantivan please sir don't curse the whole country just curse the king and so Kantivan said I don't curse anyone may the king live happily and then he died so this is supposed to be the most um, perfect patience that there is a person who is killing you and you have no animosity at all and you can find of course this kind of story in every religion that if you if you are if you get um, hit on the right cheek turn your left cheek it's the same thing so um, the uh, the patience which can ar be aroused in the heart has to be of course based on insight so this kind of um, patience is probably more than what we would be able to do at this time but maybe it would be a help if we get on the freeway <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean nobody's trying to kill us and yet we get impatient and uh, or if you know anything that happens where it's so minor and yet impatience arises and that for that this story is um, helpful to remember because we have so many moments of impatience in our lives and none of them are caused by anything that is really major so enough story no. <laughs>
Well, I'll tell you one more. I can think of one more. I can probably think of several more, but I can just think of one more right now. This is a very famous one, and that's the story of Kisa Gotami. Um, Kisa Gotami is, um, the name means uh, the lean one. See, she was a, a woman that wasn't very pretty. She was like a string bean. I suppose that would be the right uh, translation. <laughs> and uh, she wasn't very pretty and she was also poor. So she didn't have much of a chance of getting a husband. Because in those days and today too, you have to have a dowry to find a husband. So, but one day a rich merchant fell in love with her and married her. And his family was all against it. His family was furious. They didn't like this at all. But he married her anyway. And then three years later, they had a baby boy. Now, of course, now everything was all right because now they were grandparents, so everything was fine. They appreciated her and everything was great. So then everything went along nicely. She was very happy because she now had a little baby boy and the family of her husband also was appreciative of her and everything was good in her life. And when the little boy was three years old, he became sick and he died. But for her, that was such an impossible shock that she couldn't accept it. Because it meant a complete loss of her whole identity. The parents of her husband wouldn't accept her anymore because now there was no grandchild. She was afraid that the husband wouldn't accept her anymore because it is an in India also a tradition that if a child dies, it's the mother's fault, especially if a boy dies. And so she couldn't accept that, that he was dead. And her mind went a little bit crazy because she took the child and carried it in her arms and went from house to house asking to if anybody knew a doctor or a medicine that would help the child. She wouldn't accept the fact that the child was already dead. And of course, first people were very sorry for her, but when this kept going on and on and on, they got upset with her and they just didn't like to talk to her anymore. Of course, they could see that she wasn't even reacting properly. So they were, they were totally disgusted with her in the end. And she didn't have any friends, and didn't have any family, just ran all over the place with this dead child in her arms. And one day she came across a man who said to her, when she asked him, don't you have a, do you know a doctor or a medicine for my child? He said, I do know. And so she said, please take me to him. So he took her to the Buddha. And she went to the Buddha, and she knelt down in front of the Buddha and said, Look at my sick child. Can you give me medicine? And the Buddha said, Yes. And she said, Yes, what is it? So he said, Go down to the nearest village and go to the first house and ask for a handful of mustard seed. And she was just going to run off to do that when the Buddha said, Now wait. You can only take the mustard seed if nobody has died in that house. He said, all right. And if it's not the first house, you go to the next one and the next one and the next one until you find a house where they can give you a handful of mustard seed and nobody has died in the house. So she ran off to the village, <coughs> knocked on the door and asked for a handful of mustard seed. Now, mustard seeds are a very common commodity in India. Everybody has it in the house. It's like asking for a cup of sugar. And so immediately it was offered to her. And then she said, oh, has anybody died here? And so the woman who offered it said, yes, grandpa died just a few days ago. And she said, oh, I can't take your mustard seed. So she went to the next house and the maid had died. And then she went to the next house and the child had died. And she went to the next house and the next house. And she came to the last house and somebody had died there too. And then she understood right then and there. It dawned on her. Death is inevitable. 
So she went back to the Buddha and said, I understand. It wasn't medicine for the child, was it? It was medicine for me. He said, yes. And uh, then she allowed that the child be buried, which they did, and then she became a nun in the Buddhist dispensation, and it says uh, also that she later became enlightened. This is uh, also one of the very famous Buddhist stories, uh, of which there are dozens. And most of them can be found in the commentary to the Dhammapada. Most of the stories. And a lot of the stories can be found in the Jataka tales. And as I say, all of them have some um, moral to them. So, end of story. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, the Jatakas are also very old. They have been, they're very old, and um, they, they have no, uh, there's no, nothing written there that by whom it was. They are all, the, all of them are translated into English. Most of them not such excellent modern English, but many of them into modern English. And uh, I have no idea where they came from. They're folk tales. Folk tales usually don't have an author. I mean, it's very difficult to know where folk tales come from. So it's not, not an author given. And I can't tell exactly how old they are either. But they, they're, they're also from those days. I'm not sure whether they're part of the canon. No, I don't think so. I think they're part of the canon commentary. They're not canon, but they're canon commentary. But they're no author. No owner. I think I told you all the stories I was going to tell you. No, I have one more I thought of. I'll, I'll tell you one more story. Three signs. It's an important one. It's not so much a story, it's part of the Buddha's life. When the Buddha was a prince, he had been very much sheltered, extremely sheltered, because there had been a prophecy that should he ever see anything did, he would, or even sick, anyone or anything, even that, Sikha did, that he would leave the palace and become a monk. That's been a prophecy at his birth. So the father, who had only this one son, didn't want to lose him. So he made sure that nobody dead and nobody sick, not even dead flowers, were allowed in the palace grounds. And if anybody should ever become sick, they were taken out by night so that the uh, young prince would never see them. But when he was uh, about 29, he took, he asked his charioteer to take him out to the park in the chariot. And as he was taken out in the chariot, they came across a very old man who was tottering and could hardly walk and had a stick on which he was uh, leaning and looked a very sad specimen of a human being and really bedraggled and very very sad looking and so the the prince looked at this old man and he said to his charioteer whose name was Channa said what's the matter with that man Channa said he's old and the prince said are you all going to get like that? Shana said, yeah, if we don't die before that, we will. And so the prince said, well, take me home. I've got to think about that. So he took him home, and the next day the prince said, come on, take me out again. I want to go to this park. I haven't been there yet. So again they went out in the chariot, and they came across 
a sick person. Now this sick person was lying on the on the road, on the sidewalk maybe, and it was so sick that the flies were sitting on the eyes and the and the mouth and it was moaning and groaning and couldn't there was a water cup next to him but he couldn't reach it anymore and it was a very sorry sight. And the prince said to Chana, What's the matter with that man? And Chana said, He's sick. The Buddha said, oh, the prince, he said, um, hmm, we all going to get like that? And Shana said, well, yes, it's all liable to hit any one of us. So the prince said, take me home, I've got to think about that. So the next day they went out again. And as they went out in the chariot, they met a procession carrying a, a corpse on a litter to the cremation grounds and the women were walking behind the corpse and lamenting and crying and uh, sobbing and grieving and tearing their hair out and a whole long procession and there was this corpse lying on this litter which was being carried and so the prince said what's this? what's the matter with that person? and Shana said it's dead and the prince said, are we all going to look like that? Just like a piece of rock lying on a litter? And Chana said, sure. That's going to hit all of us. And the prince said, take me home. I've got to think about that. And the next day they went out again. And as they went out again, they met a monk in robes. And his face was serene. And he had his eyes down and his face was had a sort of an inner smile on it and a very serene expression and he said to Chana and who's this? he said oh it's a monk he's a renunciate and the Buddha the prince said well take me home I've got to think about that and the next day he decided to renounce the palace and the family and go out into the forest and find the answer to the dukkha that mankind has. These are called the old man, the sick man and the dead man are called the three signs. That's the, the name for them. And when he saw them, that was enough to make him go and practice, practice for six years until he became enlightened. And later he gave a description of the different kinds of people that there are and he compared them to horses. That there is a kind of horse that you only have to whisper and it already obeys. There's a kind of horse you have to pull the reins and then it obeys. There's a kind of horse that you have to use the spurs and then it obeys and there's a kind of horse where you have to use a whip. And the first one which you only have to whisper, that's the one that can, in a person, that the person that can see dukkha everywhere. The minute there is old age, disease and death, it's clear that one has to practice. That's what the Buddha did. The one where you have to pull the reins is if you can see dukkha only if it's right in front of your eyes and there is some real suffering, not just old age, disease and death, not enough. If somebody is right in front of your eyes and really suffering. And when you have to use the spurs, it has to be somebody in your family that's really suffering. And if you have to use the whip, you've got it yourself to be really suffering. It doesn't matter which one you are as long as one gets to uh, practicing. So the Buddha only needed to see strangers having the old age disease and death and then he started practicing. And 
left the family in the palace and went to the forest. And first he learned the jhanas, the first teacher he learned the seven jhanas, and with the second teacher he learned the eight. And both teachers thought that that was all there was to the spiritual path. Both teachers wanted him to become a teacher with them together. The second one actually wanted to give up all his students and give it to the Buddha or the Bodhisattva at that time. And he said no, because when you come out of the jhanas, you still have dukkha. So that there must be more to it. And then he couldn't find a teacher to teach him any more than that. So he found it himself, as every Buddha does. Have to find the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path himself. And please put the attention on the breath for just a few moments. Think about the dukkha that you have experienced in this life and anything you have understood through insight about dukkha. How it is embedded in the whole of our existence because of the constant change or any other understanding you have about the dukkha, how it relates to you. And seeing that clearly, fill your heart with compassion for yourself. A feeling of care and concern coupled with wisdom to know the way out of Dukkha. So that the compassion for yourself brings joy. your attention on the person sitting nearest you. Recognize exactly the same dukkha in that person that you have recognized in yourself from exactly the same causes and fill him or her with compassion and with the joy that he or she has also found the way out of Dukkha, the path that leads out of Dukkha. Now spread your compassion to everyone here, coupled with the joy that everyone has found the path that will lead out of Dukkha.
never imagine that there's anyone who has less dukkha. Dukkha is all pervading. Compassion is the only reaction. Now think of your parents, whether they're still alive or not, and recognize exactly the same dukkha in them that you have understood from investigating yourself. No difference. It's universal. Fill them with your compassion. Embrace them with your compassion. Think of those people who are nearest and dearest to you and recognize the same dukkha in them that you have for the same reason, same cause. Fill them with your compassion, embrace them with your compassion. Let them know that you care, that you're concerned, and that you understand. Now let the people you know arise before your mind's eye. Friends and relations, acquaintances, colleagues, neighbors, anyone you can think of. Recognize the same dukkha in them that you've seen in yourself. And let your compassion flow to each one of these people whom you know or have met. Let them feel that you care and that you understand. Think of anyone whom you don't like or who 
towards whom you are quite indifferent. Recognize the same dukkha in that person's heart and mind and let your compassion flow to that person too. No difference. All beings are exactly in the same situation. Now think of those people who have more dukkha than you yourself have. Recognize it. It's real suffering. And let your compassionate heart reach out to all these people so they may know and feel that you care and understand and want to help. Now think of people where you imagine that they don't have any dukkha and recognize the fact that that's not possible. It's embedded in every experience. Let your compassion reach out to those people too. Open your heart as wide as you can and imagine that it's filled with compassion to overflowing. Like a river that's going over its banks, let the compassion flow out of it and fill paper, and other beings near and far. 
with your feeling of care and concern and helpfulness. Let it flow as far as it will go. Touching the hearts of those that are open to it. Put your attention back on yourself. And feel yourself filled with compassion and joy. Recognizing that Dukkha is, but the way out is there too. Let the compassion and the joy be all-embracing. 